Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another great interview with one of my friends, but also one of the people that has impacted my life um, as I've listened to her story and listened to um, all the great advice that she gives. And so I'm I'm thankful to have Rebecca here. Um, I'm thankful that she's come on to answer some key questions and give us some great advice um, throughout and talking about uh, deconstruction, uh, deconstruction, deconstruction, I believe is the actual terminology we're looking for there. Um, I'm going to mess up like that from time to time. So that being the case, Rebecca, um, thank you for being here. Um, would you just kind of take a moment and introduce yourself to our guests? Yeah, uh, thank you so much for that introduction. I so honored to be here. Uh, my name is Rebecca Lynn. I am a Midwest transplant to California. So I currently live in California with my husband and three children. And I came out of the corporate world a few years ago, came out of the church world a few years before that. So my life's just kind of been in this transformative space for a while. And now I am a trauma-informed life coach. So working with people, <clears throat> excuse me, just being able to notice where trauma really does impact us. That's kind of a, a relevant topic right now. It's been much more of a prominent um, feature in discussions about mental health and things like that. And I think super relevant for deconstruction. And so that's where I find myself. I'm super passionate about that, about helping people recognize where trauma might be popping up in their lives. And then just being able to help them um, grow in awareness in all areas of their lives to really live their best self. Okay. That's amazing in and of itself. So um, big fan here. Um, love the fact that you're standing and, and helping people that are going through trauma um, and throughout deconstruction. Could you kind of uh, take a moment and uh, tell us a little bit about your religious background? Sure. So I grew up in the Midwest uh, in Wisconsin, the first 11 years. So my family's Catholic. That's a very, you know, prominent, I think, religious um, environment there, you know, fish fries on every Friday night during Lent and all that. So did my first communion confession, the whole nine. Um, and then when we moved to Iowa, when I was 11, we started going to the evangelical free church, um, in the town where I lived. And so it was quite a change going from the Catholic tradition, which my whole family was part of, and then moving into this evangelical environment. And my dad went to um, promise keepers and, and all of that. So as I went through high school um, and I, you know, reflecting back on that now, that's a huge change to go from one kind of extreme to this other extreme. Um, and that, yeah. yeah. And so that's where I came from. Um, I lived in a university town. And so once I graduated from high school, went right into that university and there was a, um, youth, a college group that was founded out of a Baptist church. And so there you go. I have this conglomeration of this Catholic <laughs> evangelical free Southern Baptist all tied up. And that's where I came into my adult years. <laughs> I didn't even know that was possible to make those kinds of jumps. <laughs> There we are. <laughs> That's amazing. That's, I mean, like, talk about like, like, I mean, that had to breed a lot of confusion spiritually, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, moving from a place where, you know, I have no direct interaction with God because the priest is that direct interaction and asking that question when I was um, in third grade, actually, this is funny. My youngest is in third grade right now, and I could totally see him doing this. I went to Catholic school till I was in seventh grade. So I was also in, you know, this parochial school environment and being taught and around nuns and all that and asking why if God loves us so much, like, why did Jesus have to die for us? And like, um, why do I have to do this confession thing? Like if he did that and everything is done, then why are we still talking about this? Um, and I think for an eight-year-old, that's kind of a profound question. I yeah. also remember thinking if we need to ask Jesus into our hearts, why? And that's kind of an odd thing. Cause they did talk about that in the Catholic school, but I know that's not like super normal to talk about in Catholic mm -hmm. spaces. Um, but they did say that. And I remember wondering, what about the people from the Old Testament, you know, when I was like eight? So it was confusing just within that environment. But then to move into this evangelical environment where I don't have to go to confession anymore. I don't understand. Why did I need to do that over here? And now I don't need to do it here. And yeah, <laughs> it's a very lots of confusion. Okay, so you have to forgive me because when you're talking about going to Catholic school, 
and you're talking about asking questions. I immediately, and this showing my age, I'm sure, but I immediately have in mind Alanis Morissette's song um, about Catholic girls. So, I mean, <laughs> I don't know why it just pops in there. It's like, oh, yeah, you had questions. You asked questions, right? You know, things that didn't make sense. But anyways, I'm sorry. That's the total rabbit trail. <laughs> Forgive me for that. Um, whatever have you. So, so asking all these questions, obviously going through three different religious experiences, at least, right? Within within your life. When did you start going through the process of deconstruction? And, and you know, like what did that look like for you? Was it there an aha moment? Was it just, oh yeah, this doesn't make sense? What what happened for you? So I there are probably three or four really distinct moments that I think were very important in my deconstruction. I think the first one was right around 2011-ish. And I was reading through the Bible really for the first time, just like myself getting into it. Um, I'd read the Old Testament before, but I was with this new perspective. I had had a really intense um, moment with God. And so I felt very compelled to go and read the Old Testament to really get an understanding of what was in there. And I remember, I so what I read was the story of David and Goliath. <laughs> and I'm reading this story and I'm like, wait, he didn't kill him with the rocks. Okay. So I'm like 30 years old and thinking he cut his head off. That's how he killed him. Why didn't they tell us this? Like what else didn't they tell us? So there was that moment of we've been taught wrong about a silly story. What else that's more serious have they not shared with us? Mm -hmm. uh, and by they, I mean, pastors, teachers, Sunday school teachers, whatever Bible studies, the whole nine. Cause at that point I had done, you know, Beth Moore Bible studies and um, Priscilla Shire and some of these other Bible studies. And I'm thinking, yeah. where was this stuff in there? Very, some of those very, very good ones. I don't want to disparage any of that, but just saying there's, there was stuff missing. I felt like I hadn't been given the whole story. Um, well, I'm not fascinated that you, in order to find out more about God, went to the old Testament. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, That's I've, always, cool. <laughs> yeah, I've always had a fascination with the old Testament. Um, I, you know, there was a, an episode that Tim Whitaker did with the new evangelicals podcast a while ago. And I think he had, um, Michael Harvey, I think is his name, the rabbi. And he was talking about interacting, you know, the <clears throat> Jewish people interacting with Christians and how tough that conversation has been because they serve two different gods. And that was like a, a point for me. I heard that and was like, that doesn't make any sense to me because if the new St new Testament was, you know, Jesus came to fulfill the law and all that, then the God we serve should be the same because God doesn't change. So that was, that's a side note. That was a more recent thought I had. So just throw that out there for anybody who wants to think about that. Um, that got me kind of in a little tailspin also, but then the old Testament for me was always the draw to who God is. Um, there's a lot in there. It's a very complex, right? It's a lot of different stories. It's a lot of different people wrote all this stuff. And so it's just fascinating to me from a scholarly point of view, not even religious point of view, but from a scholarly point of view. So there was that. Um, another moment was I read the book, The Shack, yeah. which yeah. was like life changing for me. I know it was like a heretical book. Like if you read that, then you weren't really a Christian. And I read it and thought, how in the world could you not love the the love story that this person wrote? And it's very divisive within different denominations. Yes. And being able to see um, you know, the, the Holy spirit as this little Asian woman gardener character and seeing Jesus as, you know, the carpenter dude, like we kind of all imagined, but then seeing God Papa as this black woman. And she says things like, I'm especially fond of you. And it just changed the way that I saw how God must see me. Hmm. And so that was a huge moment because how often have we been told that we are awful human pieces of garbage basically and so we don't deserve to even be here like god loved us so much because we were so awful i mean like that's the message we're given but this book was like 
God just is out here saying, I'm so especially fond of you. It's like, that's the message we're supposed that that just felt like more the message we should be sharing with people. If we really truly believe that God loves us so much. Well, and so that just felt. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just curious. I'm fascinated because I, I see where you're going with this and I'm, I'm, I'm I just want to ask. So knowing this view you have of God, mm-hmm. right. And, I love that view of God, right? Um, how, and maybe you're getting to this and I totally cut you off, I apologize. But how did you, and did you reconcile that with the God of the Old Testament? That's a really good question. I've been thinking a lot about that lately. In fact, because of some things you have posted recently. So they've, they've really gotten me to like ask some questions like how, where is that love in some of these stories? Um, in there. And, you know, I just, maybe this is okay. So I don't know. I'm just going to throw this out there. Go on. Know. It's yeah. your interview. You go on and throw this out. <laughs> so <laughs> if in fact, like, let's, let's just say Jesus came to fulfill the law. So all the things that were in place before then, like Israel was the chosen people. Israel was, you know, the, the people that God loved. So everything around them would have been open to destruction and whatever, you know, the way that things did kind of play out in the old Testament, a lot of people were killed and died and towns pillaged and all that the Israelites were disobedient. And so they faced consequences. I don't know that that points to a God that's not loving. <clears throat> I can see how it also points to a God who is, who, is not loving. I mean, I can definitely see it in both ways, but then if we say God so loved the world that he then sent his son to do away with all of that, not to save us from our sin, but instead to destroy the structures that were created in society, patriarchy, all these things to, um, liberate us from the rules and all these things that we set up in these systems, then he, his love story has in fact been fulfilled. And we are all just those people. Now, I don't know that I, I don't have a fondness for Paul at all. I actually think that Paul's writings are garbage. That's kind of my opinion. <laughs> um, so I have a hard time with Paul. Um, but he does talk about Jew and Gentile all being one and all that. Peter also talks about that. So um that things change, right? So I know like God doesn't change, but things did change. The story of humanity has changed over time. And so I think there's room for it. I guess that's what I would say to answer your question. I think there that there there's room for this having been a love story this whole time, and there is just some really ugly parts to it. I don't know though you, at the end of the day. Maybe, like when you were deconstruction just deconstructing having these thoughts um did you think there are parts of the bible then that aren't accurate that maybe they're misinterpreted by the writers themselves is that kind of how you kind of piece things together yep absolutely i think there is stuff missing i think that you know the council of nicaea was a bunch of dudes and it was yeah. In a time when they were the the there were monarchies and and kings and people trying to be actually like rulers, telling their people when they could and could not worship and all this stuff. And so it was just one more way to control people, mm-hmm. I feel like. So some of the writings, you know, there's like the um Gnostic gospels and there's the gospel of Mary Magdalene. It's a beautiful piece of literature. I think that's missing. I think we are um unfortunately, you know, not. Um, privy to some of these things you can find them you can find them on the internet but um on a large scale the way that the bible is like the best-selling book of all time people are not reading those things um and i think that's unfortunate i actually think um the gospel of mark is probably the most overlooked of all four gospels i there i have a whole lot of things i could say about all of this i love it yeah Um, but yeah in in my deconstruction journey there was a lot of questions because i think that that's how you deconstruct everything it is by taking it apart and asking these questions you know we we for a long time i know that i looked at god as very you know um male driven characteristics right and i think that when you look at the original language of like genesis it says 
they like plural gods, right? So there was, it wasn't, okay, I don't want to go down that too far, but it's the encompassing of the masculine and feminine in the, in the divine. If you look at, um, Psalms, the Holy spirit, wisdom, all these things to me that speaks of the Holy spirit, they're all very feminine. They're spoken of as she and her and all these. So to me, the feminine part is in there so much and we've just overlooked it. So it's things like that. When I get into a church environment and I hear that God is, you know, like judgment, like just judgment. Right. But then he did this wonderful thing. I think there there's so much missing in there. I think it's, it is taking away from the love story. I, when I have read the Bible, I do read it as a love story. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think we've made it into a shame story mm. that I can't get behind that. I think that's probably what drove my deconstruction the most. And I think it, it, you know, overlooking trauma and things like that, doing things like spiritual bypassing and, and just thinking like, God's just going to solve all these things, but he did give us the ability to, um, reflect on our lives and to, um, deal with our mental health stuff. And, you know, I don't, I don't know. I, I just really started seeing it as we're, we're just pounding on these things like, the shame of sin and all this stuff. And that's just not leading us to living these lives of freedom and liberation. And so to me, I can't, I couldn't be part of that anymore. Okay. So, okay. Totally. Like you've got me geeking out mentally here. All right. Cause you know, when I started the process of deconstructing, um, I went educational, right. Because because suddenly I was learning things that I was not supposed to learn. I didn't learn in seminary. I didn't learn in Bible college, you know, so forth and so on. Um, and the trauma of the church was causing people uh, based on, I love the fact you brought up the other writings, um, like the book of Enoch, huge impact upon Jewish culture. And even is, is mentioned basically in the new Testament. Um, and then you mentioned the Psalms about they, there was a belief in the Enoch, the council of gods and, you know, and God gave other gods territories. And so, I mean, like there's a whole history here that we don't get because we have the, the so-called closed canon. Yeah. Right. And so we don't get the full view of what this all is. So I love that. So let me ask you this. Okay. I could spend all day talking to you about and listen to your ideas about this, but you're a you're a multi passionate uh, entrepreneur, all right. You're a speaker, you're a writer, you're a coach, and a leadership expert, all right. Just to name a few, all right. And and you're a very successful coach, all right. You uh, you obviously just by listening to what the research you have done you kind of know the background of the trauma and where everything comes from in the deconstruction process. How did you get there to all these different awesome things you do? How did you get through deconstruction to where you are now? That's such a good question. Um, when I hear you list them out, it sounds like I'm doing way too much. I, that was my <laughs> first thought. I was it's like, very well. impressive. I mean, <laughs> and let everybody know that she is a, a, a wife and um, she's a mother of children at the same time. And she probably works another job beside it. So just to let you know, this, this lady never sleeps, but go on. <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't ever sleep. Um, So I, you know, as I was a single mom for many years. And so I think that out of that just came this, like, you do what you have to do, right? You do these things because they're in front of you. I mean, that's been my experience. People would ask me, how do you do all these things? I used to travel globally for the job that I left in May and and I would be gone one week out of every six weeks. Um, And I think part of this is being from the Midwest, this work ethic that came from this family that I come from, they owned a tree nursery and like, these were hardworking people. I always say like, I'm a blue collar person who ended up in the white collar world. Like, (laughs) and it's a weird experience because my favorite thing to do on a Friday night is sit outside by the fire and drink a Miller light. Okay. That's like my, that's my jam and football season starting. Like that is when I start to feel really alive. It's fall. Yeah. So, um, 
but how I got here, I think, you know, my story is just so filled with, I guess this connects with what I was saying before. So we, you know, not being able to abide by this shame based gospel system message thing that has become what we're, we have now in the church, in my opinion, um, I have lived a story that by all accounts, I should be hiding in the back of a church and not even showing my face. And so I think because I did work through all of these things and get to this place in my deconstruction where I know, um, it's kind of funny. I tell my husband, I think I'm agnostic. He's like, how did, did it took you this long to figure that out? I'm like, okay. <laughs> I, I, I just don't believe that there's a God out there that's waiting to punish me. I don't. And I think that people would rather people want their pound of flesh from yeah. each other. You know, um, oh, what's his name? Father Richard Rohr in his book, Universal Christ, he says that. And I it was so profound because to me that people want to hear sermons preached about someone else's sin, but they don't want to hear a sermon that's preached about their own sin. And, you know, I just kind of came to realize like, I am not a broken person. I walked in a church every Sunday that told me that I was a broken person. And I finally was like, if Jesus's sacrifice is real, if what they're saying is real and God loves me, and this was what this was for my sanctification or whatever, then I'm not broken anymore. And I'm not going to walk around like I'm broken anymore because he said that I'm not. And then that has kind of just moved now into this place of I'm part of the divine. I, you know, my story has brought me here. I was a single mom. All three of my kids have different biological dads. That's not a thing that I would normally maybe walk around telling people, you know, I'm going to, I feel totally comfortable telling you and this audience that because it highlights the fact that I should be hiding in the back pew of that church by not Feeling like you can say that that that's a shame impression, right? I mean, that's a, I mean, that's what it is. You should not be ashamed of that, but because of the structure and the, the systems of society and within the church, it would make you feel or want you to feel shame for that. Yep, exactly. Um, I came out of a drug addiction in my past. There's a lot of stuff in there. I've been divorced. I have, you know, I have somehow managed to find myself in this place where I found some success in a corporate job. Um, I did get my education. I did finish my master's degree in leadership. Um, I've traveled the world. I've done all these things. And I look at that and think, this is a byproduct of me believing that I am not a broken person of getting out of that system and knowing that I, because I am a human being, have a right to the life that I want to build for myself. And so that doesn't mean that I haven't walked through many, many days of feeling a lack of confidence or what, it, what the hell am I doing? You know, I have, you could ask my husband, <laughs> there are days I cry and say, I'm doing this all wrong. But at the end of the day, when I think about it for real, I know that because I'm a human being and I am not a broken human being that I can build whatever life I want. And so I, you know, really that was a matter of kind of the positive self-talk. Yeah. Um, doing work on my trauma. I had a lot of trauma. My kids have a lot of trauma from, you know, different circumstances in our life, but also from the church. Um, them bypassing a lot of the stuff that had happened became another source of trauma. Being able to recognize what that is and actually work with it brings me now to this place where I'm like, how can I not do these things? How can I not share this? How can I not want to talk about it? Um, I need to share this with people because people need this. Um, and I just so happen to have some of the words to talk about it. Right. Um, I'm not more, I always have said this, I am special because I am me, but I am no more special than everybody else. Everyone is special because they are who they are. It's like your superpower is you, right? You are your superpower. It's that kind of idea. Um, and I think that really is a byproduct of deconstructing from that shame-based stuff. So before we jump into the next question, I like how you you understood the and understand the pull of the idea of sin, the concept of sin. Um, where do you, where do you fall right now on believing? Is there such thing as original sin? Is it, is it just a, a social structure that was made up to explain something else? Um, 
How does that play a role in people that are deconstructing? Yeah, I, <clears throat> I've spent a lot of time thinking about that question this year, actually. Um, there's a podcast called the Bema podcast. I don't know if you've listened to any of it, but it is interesting because it goes through the actual like lit the um, literature, like literary styles. So mm -hmm. like Genesis, for example, it talks about that being poetry and it explains the poetry of it. And so that got me thinking about um, we've taken this thing and made it very literal yeah. instead of understanding that there was poetry. It was telling a story. It's even structured very specifically to be like two halves and there's a you know this and it's line. Just one too yeah i mean it's very poetic yep and so i think understanding that there's a literary style involved here and it was a poem that was being shared to kind of explain to explain something later not necessarily to give a history of something from before so that was really helpful i also um reading universal christ by father richard Rohr was a huge thing for this question. And then I've re recently been reading a book by one of my very favorite authors, Donald Miller. It's called um, Searching for God Knows What. It's one of his earlier books. I think it was published in 2004. And in that book, he talks about the idea of original sin and um, really that maybe it wasn't this sin, you know, eating the apple. It was more like this awareness. We became aware of ourselves. Um, whereas before we were just looking at really it was, it would be like just looking at God's face and basking in the knowledge that he just loves us, that we are just everything to him. But this break just made us aware of ourselves. So I think that's a really interesting way to look at it. I, I really like that. I'm still marinating on it. Um, another thought that I had earlier this year about this was that it's not so much like this original sin that now we were all just sinful because Eve ate this apple, but really this idea that out of that, maybe it's this awareness, but we also came to live in these systems that exist now, these structures. I kind of mentioned it before, the structure of the patriarchy that did not exist until then when God tells Eve, like, I'm going to give you, you know, pains in childbirth. He also says to her that he's going to make her want her husband. She's, she's going to want to, it's almost the idea of like fawning, you know, the fight, flight, freeze, fawn thing, that fawning, I'm going to make you want him so bad and he's going to rule over you. So what that's saying to me when I read that is that I'm giving you patriarchy. I'm going to put you in this system now. That's going to be hard. I don't think, I think that was the result, not this sin that we now all carry because Eve ate the apple, but we live in this structure now. That's how I look at it. So okay. I hope that answers your question, but it's, it's less, oh, okay. it's not personal. It's like, we just were born into the system now that was born out of that. That's how I see that whole thing play out. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So I, I'm not going to ask any more uh, questions off the cuff. Um, I'm going to stick <laughs> to, to what we're trying to do here. So um, doing what you're doing, being the coach that you are, would you talk a little bit about what it means to hold space for someone who comes to you? who is deconstructing, um, who is looking for help or who has experienced trauma? What does it, what does it look like? Or what's it mean for you to hold space for them? So holding space, I think, first of all, is just kind of really hard. You know, as humans, we really do want to offer solutions. We want to offer fixes. It's like the first thing out of my mouth. A lot of times, like with my kids, if they bring something to me. I want to tell them what they could do or, ask them what they might've done to contribute to that problem. And when I think about holding space, it really is none of that. Like none of those <laughs> things can show up, right? There is no offer of um, even saying, well, it's going to be okay. We don't know that. We don't know that it's going to be okay for sure. So that, and that's also just like a very nice platitude. It's something that people say. And so I think for holding space, it is acknowledging what's happening. It's saying, something like, wow, that sounds really tough to be in that spot. Mm -hmm. There's no judgment. There's no um, need to come up with a solution. Like if somebody's coming to me with a really hard thing, I'm not going to jump into all the ways they could fix it. I'm not even going to ask them, do you want to hear ways to fix it? Because that's not what they want generally in that moment. Mm -hmm. In that moment, they want to know that they're not alone. Um, you know, I know, I want to know that I'm not alone. I want to know that my experience and my feelings are valid. 
Yeah. Um, I remember one of the first times, well, this is like in the first year when my husband and I were together, I was upset about something. I have no idea what I was upset about, but he said to me, your feelings are valid. No one had ever said that to me in my life. Everyone had always told me my feelings were too much. My opinions were too big. You know, I, I'm someone that was constantly told I was too much. I asked too many questions. Um, but when he said to me that my feelings were valid, I could settle in to the safety of that space. And then I could actually move from my, you know, activated lizard brain into my prefrontal cortex, logical ability to think and really get to a place where I knew what I needed to do, because I really do believe that I know the answers for myself, for my life. I just can't always access them. If I'm feeling a lot of emotions, that's very normal to feel a lot of emotions. Our nervous systems are doing their job. When we get to that place, our nervous systems are designed to protect the organism. So when we feel threatened in any way, of course, we're going to feel fight, fright, fight, flight, freeze, and fawn. Those are the things that we are going to feel. So we need somebody to come in and hold space in that moment and say, wow, yep, this is a really tough moment. You're doing such a great job. You're really handling like the not knowing of this situation. I know that must be hard. Hmm. That's it. That's then, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, and I do the same thing with, with my clients is I actually give them my phone number. Um, because a lot of times they don't need me to tell them what to do. Right. I, that's not, that's not necessarily my job. I will ask them questions, but a lot of times they just want to be able to call and go, Hey, I'm feeling this. Yeah. You know, and have that, be able to, to speak it so they can, they can digest those emotions so they can, they can sit with them in a safe space. Yes. And then they, they usually through questions and be able to talk through it, they, they kind of know what they're supposed to do. They may need a little bit of encouragement with it. They may need a little support with it, you know, what have you, but, but providing that safe space um, for someone, I love the way you put that. It, it gives them the opportunity to safely think through things themselves and to know that they're in an environment that's non-judgmental. So I, I love that you do that for your clientele. Um, I, I think that's so underrated, right? You know, I don't know if you remember a while ago, there was a commercial where there was a lady sitting on the couch with, I think, her, her boyfriend or her husband, and she had this nail in her forehead. Yes. You remember that commercial where, you know, it's just like he just wants to fix the problem. Maybe, you know, we can. It, guys or just people i won't even stereotype it to just men but there are lots of people that just want to fix the issue and tell you what to do when that's not at all the best course of action for healing yeah. right so okay so love that um obviously um obviously someone that say they're, they're thinking about reaching out to you okay or they're thinking about reaching out to somebody else um They've been burnt by the church. They've been burnt by family members in the church. Uh, friends, you know, people are leaving. People are criticizing them. Community is broken. Um, going through that deconstruction process. Um, what are your recommendations for someone and finding that place or understanding, hey, I can open up and be vulnerable to this person. H how would you recommend or or how do you, what are some things that you would say, hey, this is somebody you should be able to be vulnerable with or could be vulnerable with as opposed to this other person? Does that make sense? Yeah. That's a really important, um, important thing to know when you're going through something like this, um, when you're going through de deconstruction or, you know, really any time that we are going outside of the norms of our societal situation, wherever we find ourselves. Um, it, you know, even something as maybe innocuous as somebody not going to college right out of high school, you know, that's maybe getting to be more normal, but for a long time, that was a, what do you mean you're not doing that? You know? So there's all, always yeah. Yeah. there when you're getting outside of a normal social structure, there's always going to be somebody that has something to say, avoid those people. That would be <laughs> number one. We usually know who they are. Mm -hmm. And so even if we feel maybe compelled to tell them because, you know, 
we just want to be honest about the situation we're going through. I think one of the things I've learned is we don't always be honest, but you don't always have like the truth doesn't always have to be said, right? It's knowing when the the person who you're going to say this to is going to be able to hold that space and not say, what do you mean you're not going to church anymore? What do you mean you're, you know, looking at these other literary pieces outside of the Bible? What do you mean you're reading the shack now? You know, it's, it's knowing who's going to say stuff like that and not, not maybe having relationship with them anymore. Um, I think like my dad, for example, um, I know he's back in the Catholic church after my parents got divorced. Super interesting. Went back to Catholic church is now married there. I just don't talk to him about this stuff. And that's hard because this is a big part of my life. It's really important to me. Um, I guess this is what I want to say. It's important to me that I understand why I am where I am and that I'm going through this, but it no longer matters to me that he understands it because it's really none of his business. He's on his own journey. And when I've been able to separate, like my journey is actually separate from some of these other people. It's my business. It's not theirs. Um, and you know, there's this adage I've heard a bunch of times, like what somebody else thinks of me is none of my business. Right. So I think that applies here. You don't really want to know either. (laughs) I don't want to know. There are going to be people. I thought my mom was going to be the worst. She's a nice lady, but I really thought it was going to be like the hardest with her because we were both really involved in the church. I used to like write the women's Bible study for the summer six week sessions. You know, I was really involved. I used to teach youth Sunday school. I did a lot in this space and I just like one day didn't go back. I mean, it was very like, we're not going there anymore. I kind of felt like I don't need to do that. And I just didn't anymore. And she really struggled, but she also was, I think my ability to, to talk about it with her in a way that wasn't accusatory, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, opened her ability then to ask me questions. So she would ask me like, why, why do you not feel like going to church anymore? And now we get into a lot more very deep topics because I have a lot of thoughts about what scripture says that is very different than what we were taught. So she and I can now have those discussions, but it takes time. You know, this is not like a, I stopped going to church and now everybody just has to accept that tomorrow. We have to, I think for me, it was really important to, to realize like everybody gets to have their feelings and thoughts about this. They really do. Whether or not they share them with me, I get to decide that. And then there was over a period of time, this realization that, you know, I would love to fix it all. Right. I think a lot of us would love to dismantle the entire thing and start it over. That's not possible at this stage for me. Maybe somebody else can, but I had to come to the realization that I can only impact the community around me. And so when I took into account, like what is one of my values is community. Another one is restoration. Those two things are really important to me. So I'm going to stop fighting that thing over there that I think is wrecking that. And I'm going to start building it over here and I'm going to do it in a different way that feels aligned with those values for me. You know, so I think sometimes there's this need to like, kind of like scream and kick and punch and all this stuff, because we just want to see this thing that hurt us destroyed. We can do that for a little while because it feels, it can feel kind of good. It felt good to me to do that for a little bit. And then we realized like, okay, how much I can either waste my time because right. There's another saying like you can drink poison, but expecting the other person, like it's like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. That's what that is. It's not going to happen. So stop drinking the poison and let's build something else, you know? And I think that that for me was key. And as far as like people and holding space, I think it's a kind of a process of finding out. And that is really hard because some of the people that like I said, I thought my mom was going to be the most difficult has been one of the best. Hmm. And so I think people can surprise us. Um, there are people inside the church that know it's screwed up and they go because they feel called to be the better version of the church inside the church. I can't do that. I am not one of those people, but there are people there. So I think there it's, it is possible to find that in the church. There are allies for that. Um, 
And then I've been surprised by people that I thought would be that just were not. So I think it's being very clear on um, your own values, which is something that for me, that's really important. I do that with all of my clients. We get very clear on their values, which can change over time, but like right now getting very clear on what are your values, because then that kind of helps guide who you can have conversations with and who might not be safe because it's all going through this filter of your values as opposed to this filter of what I'm supposed to believe or not believe or whatever. It's, it is about what is aligned with you. Um, so I hope that was a really, I hope that was a helpful I, insight. I, I love that. Um, I did. I thought that was excellent. Um, and I kind of, I kind I kind of experienced some of that, right? So when I first started deconstructing, I didn't tell anybody really um, what I was going through outside of my ex-wife. I didn't tell anybody what I was going through really for a full year. Um, I think one of the things when you're talking about vulnerability is it's not like, you know, the church asks you to be vulnerable to everybody kind of idea, right? The body of Christ, right? Um it was sitting there thinking, okay, I don't have to share my story until I want to share my story, first of all. Second of all, I like to be prepared. So I'm like, okay, if this person who I feel is unsafe asks this question, this is my response, and I'm free to walk away, right? I'm free to have an exit, and I don't have to give a reason for the exit. Right. I mean, it's empowering to think those things. Um, but then so there, I think it is it, I think it is kind of a juggling match because there are people that I thought, OK, I could share this and they'll stick with me. And there are people that I didn't think I could that end up sticking with me where the other ones did not. And it's hurtful. Yeah. Right. But. Eventually, you'll get there. Right. As long as you kind of prepare ahead and say, hey, listen. These are the non-negotiable. These are the things I'm not going to answer. These are the things I'm not going to talk about. And that's okay until I'm ready for it. So when I go to this family reunion, I'm staying at a different location so I can have an exit. Um, I'm deciding, hey, with my mom, I'm not going to talk about these things, even though she hasn't technically talked to me in three years anyways. But that's beside the point. Um, I'm not going to mention this topic around my dad. I'm not, I mean, like there are certain things that I think are important that obviously uh, for those of us that are watching, um, I think embracing exactly what Rebecca said and putting those boundaries up and giving yourself, I don't want to say the permission, but the authority, mm -hmm. you know, the empowerment to choose your own way of revealing things. So I think that's awesome. So well, that can what, kind of what you were describing there is like moving from this place of self-abandonment into this place of like really empowered um, knowledge of yourself and setting those boundaries and, and um, difficult, right? Yeah, It is hard because coming out of that environment, we, I, I know I was abandoning myself all over the place. Our identity is in Jesus. It's not anything to do with us. And so, right. You know, early on, it's just getting to know who am I? Mm -hmm. And out of that, those boundaries will become way more clear. Um, so yeah, just doing, doing that work is critical to being able to set those boundaries. It's funny. You mentioned the family reunion and staying elsewhere. I just did that. I finally got to this place where I was like, I don't have to stay there. Oh my gosh, I can stay wherever I want and I will pay for it because my comfort matters to me. And yeah, people were hurt. Mm -hmm. Those feelings were hurt. That unfortunately is a byproduct of some of this. I am not insensitive to that. I'm very aware of it, but I also know that they are adults too. And they need to be able, if they, their feelings are in fact hurt, then it is their job to say something. Um, it is not my job to read their mind. So yeah, yeah. which I love that. Is yes. hard, but that's where okay. I <laughs> prioritizing <laughs> yourself. I love how you prioritized yourself and your family. Yep. Right. Um, and I think that's with my clientele, that's one of the most difficult things, because as you said, your, your identity, everything is wrapped up in something other than yourself. Matter of fact, you're supposed to deny yourself. 
right in the in the evangelical church and so um love that you said that um yeah prioritize yourself so let me ask you this okay i'm gonna jump on to a slightly different topic more about you um talk with us about leadership what is a leadership expert and can how can someone recovering from toxic religion become vital and how can someone recovering from toxic religion make this a vital part of their life yeah that is i've been thinking a lot about that so i think when we come out of these toxic spaces we've been under the leadership of some very dangerous people sometimes you know we've seen some of these documentaries this year about um like the Duggar family and that whole thing and the very toxic leadership that that whole entire group of people is under. And even I, I know myself, we weren't in that, the mm-hmm. I, what is it? The IBF? I, yeah, you know, yeah. What we're talking, yeah. we know yeah. what we're talking about. Yeah. Um, but some of those things from that, like really did infiltrate are these other churches, churches I was part of for sure. The umbrella image. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I remember seeing that. How many times I've seen that throughout my childhood, even growing up. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, So you have that, these very charismatic, um, toxic forms of leadership, which can be really off putting when you come, when you now talk about leadership, because there are things like servant leadership, which is what I think they're trying to get at when they say like, deny yourself, right? They're trying to get to these places where we are of service. Um, I really love the idea of the 12 step groups as far as like actually helping people and it, the servant leadership really, really does work hand in hand with that and this vulnerability and creating brave spaces. If anybody's been in a 12 step program, any kind of recovery, um, I was in AA for several years because of this addiction that I mentioned earlier. I went to AA, not NA, because AA in our community is just a little, it felt more right. So that's where I went. But they really do a good job of creating these brave spaces and holding space because when you do go to a meeting, you're sharing your experience right now and people are not giving you advice. They're not um, trying to tell you what to do or any of those things. And so, you know, that's really awesome. The, the another part of being in there, though, is also being of service. And that is, you know, a servant leader, somebody who's really behaving in that way is getting in the trenches with people. They're not taking the stage. Mm -hmm. They're getting, you know, they're, they're part of the whole thing. They might even like in this one book, there's a book by Robert Greenleaf called servant leadership. And he talks about this, um, story where this group goes on this camping trip. And there's this one person who the whole time is like cleaning up the food and cleaning up all these things. And that was the leader. You don't find that out till later though. So sorry, I gave a little, gave away the story, but that's kind of the point is that our, our job is not to be at the head of the thing and be on the stage and all that stuff. That's not necessarily what it means to be a leader. So I think that kind of turns everything's turned on its head when you think about leadership in that way from what we came out of, right? We came out of this where there's a head pastor and then there might be some associate pastors, usually men. Um, and there's not a lot of room for women in leadership they might be head of the women's ministry or children's ministry, but they're not really given the appropriate respect, in my opinion, for being capable leaders. Um, I think there can also be some kind of going into some of the negative things we might've seen in these environments and what we can see now. There's also some like John Maxwell wrote a bunch of books about leadership. I haven't read a whole lot of them. I don't particularly think I, I, I don't think I ever will. (laughs) Um, I just have some preconceived ideas, which keep me from wanting to read them. I'm sure there's some really good things in there. So I don't want to disparage his work, but one of the things that he does work towards is like leaders, create more leaders. You know, you're a great leader if you can create more leaders. And I think that that's kind of a toxic mindset in my opinion, as somebody who's studied leadership, leaders don't become leaders to create more leaders. I think that just lends itself to this hustle culture that we now also are experiencing we have this, you know, where we came from. And a lot of that hustle hustle culture is actually like um, corroborated by the church community. When you look at people like um, Rachel Hollis, for example, she was one that girl wash your face and all that. And then you have a lot of MLMs that exist inside the church, yeah. and all, you know, so this hustle culture, these side gigs, all this stuff. Leadership is not about creating more leaders. Leadership is about bringing authenticity. 
It is about um, creating an environment that is safe for people. It is about helping people understand themselves better, um, helping them understand their strengths, where they can do well. If we had an entire society of leaders, how would anything really ever get done? You know, that's my question with that mentality. So I think coming out of this toxic environment, it's like undoing some of that. You know, we lived under this, this one type of leadership, but there are so many other types of leadership out there. And to me, how do I know if I'm a good leader? I turn around and see if anyone is following me. That's how I know. If people are following, then I know I'm a good leader. If no one's following me, I better get back to the drawing board. I also think being a great leader is knowing how to be a great follower. Oh yeah. Good leaders know what they are good at and they know what they're not. And so they will find someone else to look at and follow in those areas where they need help. This is where someone like Mark Driscoll was so toxic because he didn't believe he needed that at all. He was the best. So that's how, you know, he's a compromised leader already just from that. Right. Um, not to mention all of the destruction and carnage and all that, that he left in his wake and continues to leave in his wake. Um, so I think leadership is kind of tied into this, unfortunately. And, you know, e- fortunately though, on the flip side of that, we do now have more of this trauma informed society coming, you know, into, um, awareness. And so the idea that we can be aware that people are experiencing trauma in the workplace, for example, being aware that our teams, people have lives going on outside of, you know, their job. Um, even in the church, I'm seeing a lot more work being done on church hurt, you know, and people really, one of the trainings I'm going to be giving here in about a month is to a youth a leadership team for a youth ministry mm-hmm. on what it means to be trauma informed, because a lot of these kids oh. come into these youth groups that aren't going to that church, right? They're coming from families that might not go to church and youth leadership can in fact traumatize kids further. And not just with things like purity culture, but the way that they try and spiritually bypass or try and make them feel like they have to make this decision for Jesus when that's not the answer maybe to their problems. And so this trauma informed awareness that's coming into this, you know, more relevance in our culture is really important because it's shining a light on the toxic leadership we've been in. And there really can be good leadership, right? But it is really understanding that Brene Brown's so great. You know, it is understanding that brave spaces do need to exist and it is a leader's job to create those. Hmm. That's awesome. Okay. So on a lighter note, um, because I could, I'm looking at time. I could talk to you literally all day um, and pick your brain, but um, what's your favorite part of your job? And the Um, men you have. (laughs) um, My favorite, I actually, okay, this is going to sound probably terrible when I say it, but I love talking about trauma. I love it. Not, it makes me, it breaks my heart that trauma exists. First of all, breaks my heart. Absolutely. But what breaks my heart more is ignoring that it exists because then people are left to face their life without the acknowledgement that they are actually dealing with so much more than what's going on inside of their lives. Um, And so I love talking about it. I love bringing awareness. I love when people ask me, well, what is, isn't trauma just like going through, you know, like um, a really bad car accident or somebody dying unexpectedly or some, you know, some other things I won't say because, you know, trigger warnings and things like that, but trauma, big T trauma can be their one-off events that happen that might change our lives forever. And that, but you also have complex trauma and that's becoming more, um, more of a conversation in culture right now and understanding that we do go through a lot. Some of us, I definitely am a survivor of complex trauma. Um, that's been ongoing in my entire life. And so to be able to bring some awareness to that for people so they can really get healing so they can really get on this journey to wholeness. And it's not just saying this prayer and asking Jesus into your life. Cause that's going to fix it all. That means something to me. It's like I said, restoration is one of my values. I want that not just for myself and not just for my family. I want that for people because I see what happens when healing, when real healing, when real mental health care happens, that is a beautiful thing. Outstanding. Outstanding. 
Uh, I I am a huge fan of the work you do. Um, and that's because of that heart right there um, and what you just said. So um, as we're wrapping this up, okay, how can people find, follow you, support you? Any big things coming up you want to share? Any other things you want to share? Go for it. Yeah. So I have um, Instagram is where I spend most of my time on social media. That's where I'm probably the most prominent of all the places, spaces I'm in on the internet. So my Instagram handle is R-E-B-L coaching. And so, I'll put that below for all those watching. All you have to do is scroll down after this video and you'll be able to find it. Yep. Awesome. And then my website is rebelcoaching.com. So that's again, R-E-B-L coaching.com. Um, I do have some like freebies and stuff. So there's a link tree in my Instagram bio that has some of that information. Um, I do have a core values alignment exercise that I love to give to people that sign up for my, my um, email list, just because that is to me, the most important thing, knowing who we are, knowing what we value most, that's what can bring alignment into our lives. Um, so that's totally free to anybody who signs up for my email list. I've been on some podcasts. So a lot more of my story is available on those. Those are also in my link tree in my Instagram bio. So I've tried to make everything really easy to find in that, in that link tree. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah. And then LinkedIn, um, if you look up Rebecca Thomas Cole, I'm on LinkedIn and so there's just some more, maybe that's geared more towards leadership and more towards like business stuff. Um, yeah. But Instagram, that's really where I am most of the yeah. time. And I love it when people, you know, send me messages and just tell me their stories. I love that. I love hearing stories. And then I am working on a book. So when oh, that's oh, done, nice, do you want to give us like a, what's it about it? Can we ask that? Yeah. So it really is about, um, getting the life you want by burning away the things that you don't. So, you know, I come from California Well, I live in California. I come from the Midwest, but I live in California. And so we have a lot of wildfires and I see how that really, you know, changes the landscape of things. And I also see how sometimes, you know, when too much, uh, maybe too many weeds have grown up, it makes it really easy for a wildfire to catch. And that can really destroy everything. But if we can really do some of these controlled burns and get rid of this stuff earlier, we might not have to burn down our whole lives. We can really do that a little bit at a time. So that's what the book is going to be about. I'm really just helping people kind of do those little controlled burns so they can live the life they want. I am looking forward to that coming out. That's exciting. Really, me too. I'm really, it's been a lot that's of work. Exciting. So I, I'm that's excited. Awesome. For it. Yeah. Uh, well, listen, Rebecca, thank you so much for being here today. Um, as you can tell, um, as the audience can tell, I can tell, there's a wealth of knowledge, information, wisdom that we didn't even get to cover today. So um, I'd love to have you back again um, sometime if you're up for it. I love uh, it. But, you know, um, for those that are not following or, or learning from her, let me encourage you, if the links below that are going to be provided or are provided and everything else, check her out, follow her. Um, I, I look at her page, I think, at least once a day. Um, I've gone to her website. Um, you know, the beautiful thing about deconstructing is you're always in a constant state of learning. Yeah. Always. Um, the minute you stop learning is the minute that, that your majority of triggers and everything else, the trauma comes right back. You have to keep pulling those weeds or having those controlled burns, as you said. Uh, so, um, just thank you for your time. Um, as always, I wish your family and you the best and all your endeavors. And I'm excited about what the future holds for you. Thank you so much for having me. This was such a fun conversation. And we dived into stuff that I don't know that I've had an opportunity to like really share about in mm -hmm. this way before. So that was really, really fun. Thank you for just this well, space. <laughs> you know me all, you, you, you <laughs> so many things that like made me want to go off script, right? So, you know, <laughs> Um, I was like, well, that's not one of the questions. I don't care. I've got to ask this. I've got to know right? the knowledge thing. Right. So um, thank you again. Um, thank you, everybody who joined us, who has been a part of this, who listened to this. Um, feel free to leave comments below. Questions. Are your DMs open on IG or what's the best way for them to actually talk to you? Yeah. Instagram uh, DMs are great. You can also email me at rebl at rebelcoaching.com. Okay. So if you have questions for her based upon this conversation or something else, 
uh, especially as trauma informed or anything like that, feel free to uh, reach out to her. So with that, we're going to wrap it up because we've been here for a little while, but uh, love this conversation. Uh, much love to you and your family and uh, look forward to talking to you again soon. Right back at you. All right. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you later. Bye-bye.